So, this morning I was going to talk about a little bit on how we use nucleosynthetic yields to help constrain what we know about the engine and the progenitor of core collapse supernova. I'll talk mostly about stellar yields uh, and the, the yields. So the way a supernova produces yields is it has two approaches. It can just eject what was in the star. It can modify what was in the star by the shock passing through it. And then there are a couple of mechanisms for making our process from, uh, from supernova that I was going to discuss um, just briefly. Um, I think Friedel covered a lot of where we, you know, the different issues we have for how you might make our process in, in, um, in uh, supernova versus double neutron star mergers. And so I'll go into a little bit more detail on that um, for a couple of the, the different mechanisms for supernova. Um, so there's the, the kind of three ways you, or the two ways you can make nucleosynthetic yields for core collapse supernova is one, they inject what was produced in the star beforehand. Things like iron 60, it's not, it, the explosion actually doesn't, isn't likely to be the thing that produces the iron 60 that's ejected into the universe. It's produced in the shell burning layers before the supernova goes off and all the supernova is doing is ejecting it. So one, one whole set of the yields is just produced during these burning phases, during this shell burning of, the star, of a star. So you go through a series of core burning. On top you have shells that are uh, burning as well, so they're uh, driving energy, but they're also producing elements. Iron 60 being an example of where you're producing something in a shell that it, require, it, it actually requires a long a longer time than you can do an explosive yield. So you end up building this onion skin layer of material where you have uh, at the outer layers hydrogen inside helium, inside carbon, inside neon and oxygen, and silicon and sulfur, and then an iron core. The iron core is what becomes, typically becomes the neutron star. Not much of the iron core is usually ejected. Um, and then, but when you have the explosion go through, it can, oops, it can then um, produce a whole set of new products. So the shock goes through the star, it goes through that silicon layer, it burns it into nickel 56. That's what's going to um, be that energy source that powers the late time light curve. Um, it goes through the oxygen layer, can produce silicon and sulfur. Um, it can also uh, burn some of even the carbon, um, carbon into heavier elements. So you have two, two processes in the, the, when you're looking at the nucleosynthetic yields from supernova, you have two processes that you have to disentangle. What is in the progenitor star before it exploded? So if I'm a core collapse theorist, I don't, I don't actually model that. I, I grab that from someone else, so I get whatever I get from their models. And then the, when the engine goes through, I can cause extra burning. You can do, you can actually do some, um, uh, produce some, interesting elements. The neutrinos can actually uh, um, produce some weird elements like tantalum and uh, lanthanum in the, in the star as it, it's exploding out. So there's a lot of um, additional nucleosynthetic yields you can do during the explosion. But when we look at the yields, we're going to have to extract them from the uh, stellar abundances themselves. So here's a plot of done by Alex Hager where he was looking at the yields, the yields that he had from the, uh, just the stellar evolution, he normalized to just this factor of one. So he, he's dividing the final yields by the yields that he had from the star. So if it's one, that means that it's not affected that much by the explosion. And then there's places where he produced extra elements during the explosion. So all these are elements that he's producing um, in during the explosion. He produces a lot of iron group elements when he sends a shock through the star, um, some p-process elements, and he destroys some elements um, as well. So there's a production and destruction during the um, explosion. Um, and people like to make just a simple picture here where you see you have an iron core. This is the pre-supernova structure. So here's the iron core. I have silicon on top oxygen, here's that neon, there's where the iron 60 is uh, produced in that carbon layer, uh, in the oxygen, sorry, in the oxygen layer. I have 
the oxygen carbon layer, there's some sulfur there, helium, uh, and then out here would be the hydrogen uh, edge of the star. The shock goes through it, it burns some of that silicon layer, so what was silicon is now nickel, it's also where the titanium 44 is produced. Um, in that oxygen layer you produce some silicon and sulfur, in the oxygen neon layer, you also, there's some incomplete burning, you can make some aluminum 26, that's where you can make the lanthanum and the fluorine. Um, as you move further out, you're, you're doing less burning, but there are some elements like boron that you can produce through neutrinos um, in that oxygen layer. The helium layers are typically not that much affected by that shock moving out. By the time the shock gets out there, temperatures are low, densities are low enough that you don't get extra burning. So this is how the structure, the structure is changed. Um, I thought I would look at some of the stars that I've exploded and see how much the structure changes. So what I've plotted here is a, in a, a weak explosion um, where that the inner almost 1.9 solar masses fell back, so I'm only plotting 1.9 solar masses and on. So this is going to produce a gravitational mass black hole, I mean, sorry, gravitational mass neutron star of about 1.75, 1.8 solar masses. Um, the, uh, now I've plotted in, as a, a function of that enclosed mass as I move outward, so this is where the neutron star is, this is moving out through the star, I've plotted things like the carbon layer, so the carbon is right here, the nitrogen abundance here, silicon, so the silicon, only a little bit of that initial silicon layer actually gets, a, a, sorry, here's, here's the silicon, there's, there's actually the silicon layer is deep down in, it's actually falling back in this particular case. Um, and so when I drive the shock through, I actually produce some silicon because it was not, uh, the, the silicon that was made in the star's life has fallen back. So I produce a little bit of silicon. The dotted lines are all the post-explosion yields. Um, I end up producing a little bit of iron in that core. This is nickel 56 that will become iron peak, um, uh, iron as it decays. So a little bit of iron peak elements. But in this case, there's, there's, the changes are, are fairly dramatic in the center where I'm getting strong shocks. But you see there's not much difference in the carbon out in the outer layers. So you're getting these changes. Um, there's a lot of features in this. The nitrogen is, is going all around the, the map where I used to have all this nitrogen. I destroy a lot of it, burning it into other elements. Um, when I do a stronger explosion, you can, the, the effects are dramatic. It's just all over the place. I'm completely restructuring that inner three solar masses with uh, this explosion. So places where that were really strong in nitrogen, now the nitrogen's gone, it can be dominated by other elements. In this case, there's a huge, the, here's that iron core, so some of the iron core in this explosion is not falling back. Here's that iron core, so it gets ejected, it gets reprocessed, it's all turned into iron peak elements, nickel 56 primarily. Um, this is where, so in this case, I'm completely changing the inner material into nickel 56 um, with this really strong explosion. So it depends on the strength of the explosion, what you're going to do to the yields, um, but you could completely restructure the star with a very strong explosion. Um, but how do we actually do this? So the first step we do is you, if you want to do nuclear synthetic yields for uh, core collapse supernova, we have some advantages over the type 1A community. So Fritz ta talked to you about how you could do the numerics where you decide whether you want to do operator split or do the calculations in situ where you, you, you try to do them in tandem. In core collapse supernova, the energetics from the nuclear burning is low compared to the energetics of the shock itself. So operator split works fairly well. So what people tend to do is they take a, a small nuclear network, maybe 18 isotopes, um, 18, 19 isotopes. They do the explosion with this small network, run it through. That gives roughly the energetics that you need. And again, the energetics are a small factor. They're 10%. Or, or less of the total energy in the explosion. So you can get away with doing a rough calculation for the energetics, and then they can do a post-process with these tracer particles with a, a, a lot more detailed um, uh, network, typically 500,000 
or, or more isotopes in that post-process. Um, so when you want to do that post-process, you have to then go get detailed da uh, data tables for what you want to do for your nuclear synthesis. Um, the standard place that people go or the, the, the database that um, Tommy Rosher and Friedel Tielemann set up, um, they, uh, you can go, um, this is just a, 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 the part of the web page from their, their web, uh, website, which is right here, nucastro.org tables, um, where you can get things like the React Lib database. And that gives you a series of rates. The rates are given assuming that everything gets into a, a max dwelling. So when um, nuclear physicists go observe rates for, uh, for doing nuclear synthesis, they're not observing rates, they're observing cost sections, where they look and they measure, they, they're either hitting something, if we want something like neutron capture rates, they'll throw neutrons or throw particles on neutrons, and they'll look at the, uh, the cost section as a function of energy in the collision to see what kind of, um, the, what the cost section is. When we do rates for astrophysics, we typically assume everything is thermalized, so the cross section as a function of energy can be turned to a, a rate as a function of temperature. So you just get a rate as a function of temperature. Um, you can then provide the rates for a range of densities and temperatures to put that in your uh, nuclear burning network and solve for nuclear synthesis. Um, this is probably an old picture of Tommy Rauscher, but he never seemed to age when I was, uh, when, when he, there, was there was this time when he was a postdoc with me, um, where we were working both with Stan Woosley, and he looked so young, he looked like he was like 12, and so he's always struggling to get a job because it looked like he was not, um, not old enough to, to need a, a faculty job, um, when in fact he was the same age as me. Yeah, yeah, but does he, does he, look, I couldn't find an old, a more recent picture of him, but it's, when he was 30, he looked like this. I mean, he literally looked um, like he was, um, you know, 17 or something. Um, so what is, so that, now let's. You also mentioned the Gina, the and the Brussels library. Or now, okay. Just let's comment. So. What, the, what will change if you're trying to do explosions? What, how, how sensitive are the yields to what models you use? Alex Hager said, okay, I want to look at my detailed different uh, progenitor masses and ask the question of how sensitive are the yields to the exact progenitor mass? And this is where Friedel had mentioned earlier on where you model a 20 solar mass star and then you model a 20.1 solar mass star and because the silicon layer can, uh, the silicon shell burning can be more or less explosive, doing more or less burning, you can get a very different structure in the core. Alex did the, and it's not just the silicon shell, it's the oxygen shell, it's the carbon shell. Alex went and looked at his, his fine grid of stellar models, so he went from 12 solar masses to 35, looking at increments of 0.1 solar mass, if you ask the question, what are the yields when I explode these all with a simple model? So here's the yields he's getting. It's the core mass uh, in, uh, divided by solar mass. So he's get, telling you what the distributions of yields are versus the initial mass of the, the star. And you, you can see that within, as he's just moving through this, this range of models, he's, he's very wildly in the, uh, this is the neon oxygen layer. Um, it's just varying like crazy across the stars. So there's no, there's no continuity in here. It's not like, oh, I have a 15 solar mass star, so a 17 solar mass star is going to just, you know, smoothly vary with, with, uh, um, with mass. It can move around quite a bit. And you see that structure even in the silicon sulfur layer. You see it in the, um, you know, in almost all aspects of the model. It's a little bit more smooth. I mean, okay, yes. Carbon oxygen and the helium are, are fairly uh, continuous, but there's a lot of structure here, and it's all because of this, you know, mixing problem that we have in, in stellar models. So that's, that's one of the errors that we have in doing nuclear synthesis. It's one of the things that makes it difficult. You know, you are never going to know to within a few tenths of a solar mass 
what was the mass of your progenitor star in an explosion? I think it's hard to even get it within a few solar masses. And yet, we see this wide variation in the yields. Um, and because it's not some continuous thing, you, you're not going to be able to use the yields to say, oh, this, I got this, this kind of uh, ox or neon oxygen shell. This must be a 23 solar mass star. Because the problem is I can get the same thing with a 17 solar mass star. Um, so it makes it hard to actually um, use these as your, your favorite uh, diagnostic of what you know about stars. Um, I thought I would look in a little bit on what about the dependence on the explosion? Because this is just on the progenitor. Um, what about the dependence on the explosion? So what I wanted to do is take what we know about the explosion. So this is, again, the standard explosion picture I want us to use and say, how can I parameterize and run a series of exploding models, make a suite of models to incorporate this effect, this, this model into a 1D explosion um, code so I can do a whole suite of simulations. So what I want to do is take this, this picture. I have this region where material is falling down in. I have a proto-neutron star that's heating material, and it's convecting, and it convects until it explodes. So you can imagine if I want to mimic this in 1D, I need a region where I'm depositing energy, because there's energy deposited down here, but now it's convecting and getting distributed in this whole area. So I need to somehow deposit energy in this convective region. It has a time scale that I deposit that energy. It has an energy rate that I have to deposit that energy. And I do this until I drive an explosion. So I can, I can say uh, that's, that's the model I want to do. The problem is even after it's lost to the explosion, material can fall down and inject more energy. So that duration of the explosion can be a, a problem where I have to keep on adding energy even at late times. Um, so there's a range of things that I have to include in the models. But you can imagine doing a parameterized model where you do, you say, OK, I have an energy injection rate. I have an energy injection region, and I have an, you know, a time evolution for that energy injection. And that can then um, produce my explosion energy, my remnant mass, and my nucleosynthetic yields. Um, most me methods in the literature right now just pick one method. They say, I'm going to do this. I'm going to increase the cross-section. I'm going to do a 1D code. I'm going to increase the cross-section for neutrinos. That's going to up the energy injection. And then I'm going to see what the explosion is. When you do that, what you're really doing is, sorry, is saying, I'm going to deposit the energy in a very narrow region right near that proto-neutron star. Because the, the density goes down fairly dramatically. The neutrinos deposit most of their energy just right here. So you're actually neglecting that convection that would distribute the energy when you do that particular engine. But it is a choice, and it, it get, will give you a result. And that's what a lot of the methods do. The other one, the one that uh, um, Alex Hager was using, is he was just, he just puts a piston in. So he doesn't worry about this injection region. He doesn't worry about the model at all. He's just going to drive out an explosion. He'll get an explosion energy in the end. So he'll get an explosion energy. He'll get a remnant mass. Um, you can get a ra range of results. So this, you know, it, it, it will work. And it's, it's, um, you can get a set of results. We don't yet know the errors in the set of the results um, that you can get. We, you know, we're starting to get a handle with Alex Hager's study as a, a function of mass of the progenitor, how stellar models, the errors in the stellar models, but what about the errors in the, the supernova explosion engine itself? So I've done this. I parameterized. The, uh, the, the explosion energy, I used three different models, only three now. So I, I said, OK, I'm, I'm going to study the, the, the role of the explosion ener energy, so the explosive engine, instead of, of the progenitor. And I'm going to see what kind of variation I get. So this green are 15 solar mass models. The red are 20 solar mass models. The blue are 25 sol solar mass models. These are all, are all from Alex Hager. Um, I then played with the way that I inject energy. And the first question I'm going to ask is, what is the remnant mass? So on this axis, I have the explosion energy. Here's the remnant mass. For these different models, the there is a trend where you see that if I, for a given energy, I will have a bigger remnant mass for a bigger 
progenitor. That's just because the iron core is bigger, it's harder to eject it, there's more fallback if you have a bigger progenitor. But within this parameterized model, I can make anything explode, and if I make it, if I give it a really strong energy, it will have a reasonable remnant mass that is within the neutron star limit, um, depending on what I do. It turns out, with those free parameters, I can even make a modest explosion energy for a 25 solar mass star. Remember, 25, the blue are 25 solar mass stars. That's a, a one foe explosion that produces a fairly modest compact remnant. Um, so I can, I can control, I can even, and what I did there is I kept on in, injecting energy at late times, and so it prevented any fallback, and so I just get the explosion of what was the proto-neutron star mass at the time of explosion. Um, and so I hadn't made a choice there, but that's the only choice I made. So I can make a low mass remnant neutron star if I just keep on injecting energy at late times. Um, so you can, unfortunately, this tells you, within what we know about the explosion mechanism, we could get a wide range of results. There are some basic trends that we can look at. You know, the more, more energetic the explosion, the smaller the remnant mass, but there's a lot of variation we can get there. Just a very quick question. For the same 25 solar master, how, how do you understand this, this scatter, just this, this changing the explosion energy? So, so because I'm not just changing the explosion energy, I'm changing how I inject it. I can get this scatter. So what I did is I, if I just did an explosion where I deposit the energy very quickly, and after a few hundred milliseconds, the energy deposition stops because the shock is moving outward, then I get a lot of fallback. But if I say, okay, I've driven an explosion, but I'm going to keep on injecting energy. Because in this case, I was trying to reproduce those low remnant masses for one, f I see results in the literature where they have a one full explosion, 25 solar mass star. There is no way in just a normal supernova engine that it wouldn't have a lot of fallback. The way you can do that is keep on injecting energy. So I was trying to figure out what they had done. This is what they did. There's physical reasons why this might happen. If you have a little bit of fallback, you can drive extra energy. If there's a magnetar down there, it can stop the accretion and, and add extra energy. So there are ways you can imagine getting this scenario. But, uh, but I wanted to understand how they got it. And so that's how I got that range. Some of these ranges is just, do I have a longer duration explosion or not? That, that will determine how much fallback you get. So if you use a piston, you are essentially driving energy to late times, you don't get much fallback. So there are ways to prevent that fallback, and that, was, that is what really de determines the remnant mass. That also determines the yields, because that inner material is where all your heavy elements are made. If it falls back, you don't see it anymore. So we can look also in this, I apologize for this plot beforehand. Um, it, it's, a, it's a mess. But here's yields of a set of elements. The open triangles are oxygen. The closed triangles are neon. The open squares are magnesium. The X's are silicon. Um, the closed squares are sulfur. Then I have argon in the star. Calcium is the open circle, and iron is the closed circle. So here, down here, are iron and carbon. Over here is uh, the magnesium and, and silicon. Up here is argon and sulfur, and over here is oxygen and neon. And it's the yields of these explosions. Again, that list of explosions where I had different remnant masses, it's the yields as a function of explosion energy. So you can see there's some basic trends um, where the more energetic you get, the more iron you're going to produce. So you can produce more iron as you get more energy. Some things go down, things like uh, oxygen, the more energetic I get, the less oxygen I make. That's because I'm hitting that oxygen shock, that oxygen layer, and I'm burning it. So I'm burning more oxygen when I do that. So a lot of you, the, the oxygen, the lighter elements, oxygen and neon, go down with uh, explosion energy. The heavier elements increase with, with energy because I'm burning more. Uh, I'm, my shock is burning more uh, material in, into that. But the, there's also, you have to keep into the effect of, here's where I have a weak explosion energy, but I still produce a lot of iron. These are the models where I produced a weak explosion energy by having a low level of energy being deposited at late times, so I did not have any of the material fall back. In this case, you, what you're getting is a lot of the iron is falling back before, um, um, before it can get, uh, uh, 
you know, so it doesn't get ejected. So the iron and calcium are falling back in, in these scenarios. But if I, if I can prevent any fallback, I can also produce a lot of iron. So the other trend you can look at instead of as a function of the uh, energy is I can look at it as a function of the um, remnant mass. And there it's a little bit more obvious. If the remnant mass is low, I get a lot of iron out. If the remnant mass is high, no iron is making out um, uh, of the explosion. So there there's some basic trends where if this material starts to fall back, so here beyond some limit, most of the argon and sulfur are falling back and not getting ejected. So there's basic trends you see, but there's a lot of scatter. Um, and it's actually, you can see already, it's hard to tell the difference between a 15 and a 20 and a 25 solar mass star just by their yields. Um, and, uh, um, and that is something that we want to do, and it's something we try. And in fact, here's some, some work that was done by um, uh, Samara Safi Harb's group in, uh, in Canada, where they looked at a remnant, they picked regions and said, okay, in each of these regions, I'm going to study the yields, I'm going to go look at spectra, and they were using XMM, and so they looked at each of these regions, and for each of these regions, they got detailed spectra, so they, this is XMM, there's, there's a couple detectors, the red and the black um, points are the two different sets of detectors on XMM. Um, that new detector, which I don't, I, I, I'm not being an observer, I don't know how the new CCD detector, the PN detector, is different from the metal oxide semiconductors that are the standard detectors on, on XMM. Um, but those are the two data points from those detectors, and they just put Chandra on as a, a comparison to see the, the, how well they agree as far as line, line shapes. Um, so they then have these lines, and they fit them to a model, uh, a plasma physics model. The difficulty with these plasma physics models is the, these, th these elements are not in any kind of equilibrium. So you, you cannot assume an equilibrium solution for the excitation states of these elements. So they see, the, they see these lines, and now they do the difficult thing of what do, they, what do they think the excitation levels of the atoms were so that they can infer an abundance from these excitation lines? Um, and there's a lot of work here, and depending on who you talk to, it's impossible to do correctly versus you can get a first best guess with it. Um, so I, I am not showing plots by people that think it's impossible because they don't produce results. Um, but understand that there's going to be a, a group of people who say you can't just fit these lines and, and then actually get an abundance. But here they have, they fit the lines with this, they have a code called VP shock, which is a uh, non-equilibrium uh, plasma model. And they fit this curve pretty well, so they can get a nice fit. And from that, they can get abundances. So they've produced a series of abundances. Um, and this is, uh, apparently I did not cite their paper anywhere. If you need the citation for this paper, I can, I can get it for you. Um, this is the abundances um, for, they took the ratios of oxygen to silicon, magnesium to silicon, sulfur to silicon, and iron to silicon. Um, and here's the abundance ratios. Um, as, a, as relative to solar for uh, their models. The red stars are their models. And then they took uh, three, three models from Woolsey Weaver in 95, and then a couple models from Ken Nomoto, and said, same three models from Ken Nomoto, and said, how well can we fit our observed yields to the yields that they produce? And if you look at it, it looks like the models produce fairly well the oxygen to silicon and the magnesium to silicon ratios, but they don't do so well at matching the sulfur to silicon or the iron to silicon ratios. Here's, here's the range of models, the smack in the middle. Um, here's the models here for sulfur and silicon, and the observation is way higher. Um, so there's a couple interpretations of this. They have big error bars on this ob observation. Perhaps it really is this lower value. Um, uh, and then the iron is also a low value. Um, or we're missing something in the models, and that's what we need to understand. So I took my grid of models, where I had a much bigger grid, and I tried to produce the same result. And if anything, for the three progenitors I use, even with this wide range, the, the values were around one. So again, 
that it fits well for the oxygen to soak in. I, I did a couple others. Magnesium to soak in fit fairly well. But I am coming nowhere close to making the sulfur that's needed to, to explain the observations. And with my models, the iron, I, I don't have the, the strong, um, uh, the really strong uh, 25 solar mass models in this plot. But that's almost the only way I'm going to make the iron in this plot is by saying I have those models where I didn't have any fallback at all by doing a, dr uh, a strong drive. Um, so those models, I just don't have them on the plot yet. Um, so it's, it's hard, you know, even with this wide range, so I can get a wide range of results, and it's certainly hard to tell the difference between a 15 and a 25 solar mass model just by y these yield ratios. Um, but the observations are pushing us to say something might be wrong with your models. Um, and so I've done the suite of models with 15, 20, 25 solar mass, and I'm not making huge iron yields. It's getting hard to make those iron yields. And I think it's telling me that my models are not, not ideal. My progenitors are not ideal. Um, because I really have tried to vary the, the explosion energy quite a bit, and I still don't produce the high uh, amounts of iron that we see in some of our explosions. Um, here is another, so, we, so it doesn't look like the, the Kepler models are working very well. So, and they, we, we have not produced yet a Kepler model that produces a high amount of titanium, um, at least one that I've used. Um, but there are models, other codes, so this is a results from the Tycho code that Dave Arnett and Patrick Young use, and they were trying to match the Cassay supernova remnant. Cassay has a very particular situation where it produced a whole bunch of titanium, about 1.5 times 10 to the minus 4 solar masses of titanium. Um, most of the models that I produced, I didn't show you titanium with those models um, in the, uh, the 15, 20, 25 solar mass uh, models from Kepler from Alex Hager, but none of those produced more than about 5 times 10 to the minus 5 solar masses of titanium. This particular Cas A progenitor from Patrick Young, um, uh, well, so this is what the results are. These are the models by Patrick Young trying to match it, and we, we matched it not just by looking at different progenitors, so the, the code on this is M23 tells you it's a 23 solar mass star, then um, the BIN means it's a binary, so it, it was a binary uh, uh, system, so we removed some of the hydrogen envelope to, to do a binary. It had an explosion energy, the E, and the number following the E is the explosion energy in pho, so it was 1.1 pho explosion. And the A at the end says it's asymmetric. So 23 solar masses are a binary. It produced about 0.02 solar masses of nickel. So 0.02 solar masses of iron. A, f a low number of, of titanium, a few times 10 to the minus 5. This looks a lot like a lot of the Alex Hager uh, yields that I'm getting from the Alex Hager models. But and here's a 16 solar mass star. If I up the energy sum to about a 2, two-fo explosion, that 23 solar mass star suddenly starts producing almost a tenth of a solar mass of, of iron um, and a much greater value for the titanium. I, another model where it's 2.3-fo um, uh, explosion actually produces over 0.2 solar masses of iron and um, over 10 to the minus 4 solar masses of titanium. We have more models. Um, with the new mixing layers, the, the new mixing algorithm that Dave Arnett has implemented, and those also produce a, large, a much larger fraction of titanium and iron. That seems to be what's fitting this, this Cas A remnant, where the, the amount of iron is now well above 0.1 solar masses in this system. So there are at least some extreme systems that require um, you know, a lot of both titanium and iron. This is not what we expected based on all of our supernova observations before this. So it looks like we can use um, th things like peculiar supernova to tell us something about what both something about the progenitor and the explosion um, when we look at these yields. Um, but it's because we're getting pushed into corners. It's because we're not matching the data as well as we thought we would, um, and so. When we're looking at our models, realize you can always get the data to match in the galactic chemical evolution models. That's a, that's a, a big mix. There's lots of free parameters. You can tune things to make it match. When you look at individual progenitors, it gets a little harder. 
Um, and, and you do have to, it's really pushing us to learn things better. Um, I'm going to come back to titanium and Cassé, but before I do, I want to just mention briefly some of the other ways you can make R process. So we had, we have double neutron star mergers, they make a nice clean R process. The, the other model before that, the kind of standard model before that, was you just have, you, you launch your supernova explosion, you have a neutron star wind, and you're blowing off material, and that's going to make the R process. That blowing off a wind off of the neutron star, it's a hot neutron star, it's still emitting neutrinos, it's blowing out a wind, it's that wind that's going to produce the R process. The problem with that particular wind is it's not neutron rich enough, and so it typically doesn't produce, it, it, it's very hard to produce that third iron, that, sorry, the third R process peak. It doesn't produce that, the heaviest um, R process elements. So people have struggled with that. There's been work done by George Fuller and his group to look at um, uh, how can you change the neutrino interactions so things like neutrino oscillations to make a higher R process. That wind can also perhaps be saved by strong magnetic fields around the neutron star, confining the, the wind so it takes longer for the material to get out. That gives you more time to do neutron capture. Even though you have less neutrons, if you have more time to do neutron capture, you can actually get the uh, R process. That's, the, the, that's kind of the, the fixes people have tried to do with the wind models. Um, it, there's, there's a lot of work on that. I'm not going to show that too much. I want to talk about a couple of the R process mechanisms that are alternative proposals for how to make R process from poor collapse supernova. Um, and one of them is this, this work by um, uh, Nishimura where they looked at if you, if you do have a neutron star this form, but you do have those, that rare case where enough rotation to generate strong magnetic fields and make a strong explosion, Nishimura in 2017 found that they can produce that third R process peak. So here's the yields for their different models. And, and the problem is if they're, depending on the model, they can either produce that third R process peak or not. This, so between this um, M model and this uh, uh, H model, I'm producing you know, enough R process in the third peak and I'm producing nothing and barely even getting any in the second peak. So there's a big range of results that you can get with this model. If you want more details, Friedel knows this way better than me so he can talk to you about it. Um, but this, this is a one possible mechanism if, if we do need our process from Corcolab Supernova, we have to look into some um, formation scenarios like this. And I just point out that the other, the other R process uh, model that we, we'd, I, I've already discussed earlier was that if you look at the fallback, so this is again the fallback as a function of time, we get these high rates of fallback. If we then model that fallback and uh, uh, get the ejecta from that fallback, it looks like we can also produce the R process from material falling back onto neutron stars. Um, it would only work in this case, again, in a rare scenarios where you have uh, a lot of fallback. So it's in those, those supernova that have a reasonable amount of fallback. Um, this, is, this is the signature from that model. I already showed you guys this earlier when we were talking about remnant masses and fallback. Um, so you, you might be able to make our process signatures from these elements. Um, so there's, you know, the, the nucleosynthetic yields of our process are, uh, if we actually need Korkoloff supernova to produce them, they start telling us something about either fallback or magnetic fields or, or something like this about the explosion mechanism. So the first step there is to find out whether we need it. Um, and I think in a few years, LIGO is going to tell us whether the rate of no neutron star mergers is high enough to explain the R process or not. If it's not high enough, we're going to go back to the drawing board and study these, these uh, scenarios in a lot more detail. And we're going to figure out what we, can we learn about the explosion mechanism from these yields. Um, I want to spend the rest of the, the lecture on titanium-44, and mostly because uh, with the launch of New Star, we have a, um, a new window into um, looking at uh, Titanium 44. And it's, uh, I think, if I would ask for, you know, what is the, uh, the last decade or two, what was the 
best evidence for something going on in the engine? What is the strongest evidence? What's the le least debatable evidence pushing toward a, the convective engine um, model for supernova? It has been this titanium result. Um, it's probably not as dramatic as the neutrino detection of 1987A, but it's uh, probably the best, uh, you know, there's best evidence for this kind of convective engine that we have. Um, so titanium 44, and so a lot of these slides I've stolen from Brian Greffenstedt, um, who um, uh, gave a talk recently at the 1987A, 30 years after meeting. He was the uh, scientist in charge of analyzing the new star data and looking at titanium-44. Um, so titanium-44, unfortunately, is a complicated process. So titanium-44 is, is right here, somewhere, I, I, can't, I can't go up straight, but it's, it's right around here. There are lots of paths to which you can produce titanium-44, to which you can destroy titanium-44. There are lots of rates that can change the the abundance fraction of titanium-44. So it is a nightmare uh, isotope in, in the sense of how do we actually, how do we calculate how much titanium you could produce. But the advantage of it being so dependent on a lot of different scenarios is it's a very sensitive uh, to the exact conditions in your explosion. So when we describe the conditions of the explosion, and we usually talk about it in the form of trajectories, this is what we mean. Um, here I have dr uh, drawn several pieces of matter. These are like tracer particles that uh, Fritz Rupke was talking about. Where I take a tracer particle, it gets shocked, and I follow its evolution. So here's this magenta line. We'll use it as an example. Here's a tracer particle where the shock is moving. It hits that tracer particle right here. It raises the temperature, so this is time, this is temperature. So the shock hits this material, it shocks up to a high temperature, and then it cools off. Here's another uh, piece of material a little bit further out. It gets shocked a little bit later, gets shocked up. It doesn't get us to the same high temperature because, it's, uh, because it was further out, the shock is weaker, and then it decays down as well. Another piece of material shocked and raising. And so I did two different, I have uh, tracer particles at different mass coordinates for two different progenitors, 15 and 25 solar mass star, but you see the same features in all of them. Shock hits it, rises up, falls off. But here's some, here's some uh, weird features. This one cools off, and then it gets hit by a reverse shock as the shock's moving out, heats up again a little bit, and goes back down. This kind of detail, unfortunately, changes what your yield is. So knowing this exactly is important. Um, typically what we do though is say, well we could probably fit this with a simple, either an exponential or a power law decay where we say it gets shocked up and these two black lines are two examples. This is an exponential where I assumed the material got shocked, heated, and then it exponentially decayed with time. And here's a different way of parameterizing it where I shock heat it and I let it be, I use a power law which is essentially just assuming it's moving out at a constant velocity and then it evolves with time as well. The power law typically matches our data a little bit better, but in all of these, do you see these, this feature here is not going to be ma matched by either an exponential or a power law. Nonetheless, that's what we use, and the reason we use it is then we can do detailed studies of the yields. So here's, um, there was a study done by Georgios Mikotsius where with Frank Timmons, where they looked at, they assumed the material got shocked, heated up, and then decayed with this power law decay. And they asked the question, what am I producing for titanium for different peak temperatures of that shock and, and densities at that peak temperature? So they, they say, OK, get shocked, it, heated to some peak temperature, say 6 times 10 to the 9 Kelvin. And at that temperature, it had a 10 to the 6 um, gram per centimeter cube density. And then they, they're going to let it decay, and then they're asking the question, how much titanium do they produce? And one of the things that they found out is there's a lot of different regions where the conditions are different in the, uh, in the scenario, and that changes how the titanium is produced. So the, the classic one is this kind of alpha-rich, where you, you, you shock heat up, you produce a whole bunch of alpha particles, and that's what's dominating the burning. Um, 
That is the region where you can produce the most titanium. It's the simplest path to making titanium. You just do alpha, alpha capture until you get up to titanium-44. Um, it's, it's a simple burning process. Um, uh, alpha particles are two, two protons, two neutrons. Titanium, you just, if, you, if you can take 11 of those, you've made t titanium, uh, 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 for, sorry, yeah, titanium-44. So you can, do, you can do it in that scenario. Um, uh, there's, if you're really hot and low density, photo disintegration dominates this, the elements, and that's going to get you on a different path. This, this complicated path that I, I showed you here, oops, showed you here, if, I, if, if it's really high temperature, low density, photo disintegration is going to change um, what, what path I get. If I get, there's a region where um, the you get the, in, as you're coming out of NSE, you evolve into some uh, islands of structures that are still in uh, egostatistical equilibrium, but not with each other. So they, we call it quasi-statistical uh, equilibrium, QSE. And you can get leakage out of the titanium and destroy the titanium. And so there's this valley here, it's almost a chasm, where I make almost no titanium at all. Um, so you can get a scenario where you're not making much titanium at all. Tragically, um, the previous studies of titanium, they picked a trajectory that was right on this, near this valley. So they said, oh, this is the really important, they were looking at what are the important nuclear reaction rates, and they were right along this valley, so they were biased by the fact that they were right near this valley. Um, and then, the, so there's other regions where you're silicon rich, alpha proton rich. So you can get a, a wide range of results depending on where are your trajectories on this map. So it's important to see where those trajectories are. Um, here are, you know, points of peak temperature density from different explosion models. Some of these are even asymmetric models where we just looked at asymmetric models. And you can get a range of results. If I want a lot of titanium, I want to be here where I'm producing a lot of titanium. So I want to be in this region. If I, you know, this, this particular model produced almost no titanium because most of the particles were in this valley region. Um, now, I will tell you this plot by, because uh, I don't think I have this in, my, um, in the talk, this plot changes dramatically depending on um, what you use for your rates, what you use for the um, uh, electron fraction. So you can make differences in the results just based on um, conditions for rates and, and, and electron fraction, which are, are determined by the engine. The great thing about that is titanium is really sensitive to everything we put in. The bad thing about it is it's really sensitive to everything we put in. Um, nickel, on the other hand, is great. You produce about the same nickel no matter what for these trajectories. This is a nickel yield, so it's a fraction of 1 to 10 to the minus 10. Almost all of these models produce a lot of nickel 56. So nickel 56, I produce roughly the same. Um, for all these trajectories, but then bear in mind, nickel 56 is not a good tracer for what um, we're studying. Oh, it looks like it did um, show you different uh, uh, neutron fractions. So this is how, if I assume the ejecta, I'll have a neutron fraction of 0.05. This is what that, that plot looks for the titanium production. This is what the plot looks like if I use an electron fraction of 0.0506. So I changed it by, you know, one per, or one percent, and this is the kind, This is how these these models change. So it really is sensitive to the the electron fraction. There was an idea at one time that the neutrinos would actually set the Ye even above point. Sorry, these should be 0.5, not 0.05. So 0.5 and 0.506. Um, so this is the difference I get from uh, um, essentially a, an even uh, electron fraction versus one that's 0.506. Um, and so it really does depend. That valley can increase quite a bit if you have a higher YE, and it'll change the results. So we go back and ask the observers, what kind of results do they get? Um, so they're going to go look at the titanium-44 is produced. It then decays to calcium-44, producing three um, uh, gamma rays and some positrons. There's a uh, an MeV gamma ray, 1.157 MeV, and then two X, you know, hard X-ray uh, um, photons, one at 68 keV and one at 78 keV. New Star was designed to detect these two um, uh, photons, 
So it's ideally suited to go look for the titanium in uh, uh, supernova remnants. Here's the cast iron remnant. This is the map. The, the, in this color, the red is iron, the green is silicon, and this blue color is the titanium-44 map. So this is what New Stars provided us. We had the, the silicon and the iron from, from uh, satellites like Chandra. New Star produced this titanium map. Um, you can then look at one of these regions, and you can measure the lines. So here it is. Looking in this region, here is the line structure. So we're seeing the lines from the, the titanium-44. Um, you can look at another region. And you can look at the lines there. So in some cases, it's harder, harder to get these lines. You can get different um, velocity values, so it, it gets harder to distinguish the lines. You have to do some work to figure out um, the blue shift, red shift of these lines. This one's in a region where it's mixed with the iron. There's the, the region before was pretty much clean um, with not much iron observed. Um, and so you can use these to then make maps of what is the titanium abundance as a function of um, line of sight. So you can, you can start to make a map of the, the titanium distribution. And this is what Brian Greffenstead did. So there's Brian. Um, and let's see if this works. So these, these values here are where the big iron production rates are. And this is where all the titanium is. So the titanium is in these regions. This is where you see clumps. Um, a feature here that you, see, you should point out is there's a lot of material in the center where we don't see iron. What we believe is that there is iron there, we just don't see it because it's uh, not been hit by any shock yet. So you only see the iron if it's been hit by the reverse shock. It's not hit yet by the reverse shock, so we don't see it. Um, but you can see that there's also some titanium where there's iron. So here's a titanium clump where there's iron. There's also iron clumps where there's no titanium to be detected at all. So it's, it's, that doesn't mean there's no titanium there. It's just it's too dim for us to see it. Um, so there, you know, we're starting to get an idea of what is the map of this titanium um, versus iron. Um, and that's going to provide some clues into the explosion. I just want to show you, this is a, um, and maybe not the best way of, I, I tried to give it Patrick Young to do a, a 3D ma map like the previous one. This is looking at the titanium to iron ratio and taking slices, so looking at different, you're, you're looking you're looking as it's projected at you and then looking at slices as you move in. So the, the, this image would be pointed at us. That image is far the furthest away from us. And this is the um, titanium to iron uh, distribution in, in this exploding model. Um, I will say that he did not try to match uh, Casse at all with this. This was actually he didn't even know that this was a project that he should be doing. He had a star that had been exploded, and he calculated the yields. And so what he's calculating here is the titanium to iron ratio. Um, so if it's, uh, in a lot of cases, there's a lot of iron here. And then in, in some cases, he's actually making almost 1% um, of, of titanium per, per iron atom. So he's, a, he's producing quite a bit of titanium in this. This particular model produces, pr produced four times 10 to the minus four solar masses of uh, titanium 44. So well above that, uh, of the 1.5 times 10 to the minus four um, observed in Cas A. So we, there are stellar models that can produce a lot of titanium. He also produced well over 0.1 solar masses of um, iron, I think it was 1.15 solar masses of iron. So he's actually producing the yields um, all really accidentally, because he wasn't even trying to, uh, uh, to match Cas A with this model. Um, so it, it looks like we can get weird diff a range of ratios where the titanium is, is a large fraction of the iron to titanium being just minuscule in the iron. So you can imagine getting scenarios where, like, the, in this place here, there's not much titanium, um, um, and, and there's, there's places where there's a lot of titanium. So it's, it's ranging depending on the model. Um, the other thing that you can do, and I, I apologize for this being yellow, it's yellow for a reason, um, it's the, well, you can look at the titanium-44 distribution with respect to the compact object and the compact object's velocity. So the yellow arrow here is the 
um, velocity of the compact object, the, the cyan colored arrow is the um, direction of the, the bulk motion of the titanium. So it looks like it, it, this ejecta mechanism for kicks may be right. It looks like the, it, the titanium is getting hit strongest this direction, the, um, the, uh, uh, the compact remnant went the other direction. So momentum was conserved and the, the titanium really is tracing that explosion. And here's, here's again the, the movie that Brian has made of showing this. So you can see they're almost opposite each other, which um, I can't say that theory predicted because there were so many theory models that we would have predicted anything, but this does tell us that that kind of ejecta model may be the right model for these um, explosions. And certainly in the, this model by Patrick Young, um, this was using a, uh, the, it actually is an ejecta model where the, the uh, core, the compact object is going in the opposite direction as the, the exploding star. Um, so it looks to us, you know, so there's a couple things that the titanium has done for us. It is actually, um, um, it, it, it showed these kind of basic lobes moving out that a, a low mode convective engine would explain. It's hard to explain that with a jet engine. It's hard to explain it with a strongly rotating bimodal explosion. So it really does look like this kind of standard convective engine is what is explaining Cas A. Um, there's, there's almost, um, you can try and get around it with the jet. You can argue that there's some jitter in the jet that's causing these structures. That jet then also has to have the jitter be such that whichever direction the jet is pointing more strongly, the uh, compact remnant is going the opposite direction. Um, there's difficulties with that. Um, it, but at this point, uh, I will tell you that as far as um, most of us are concerned, this is pretty much strong evidence that you know, it's either the convective engine or some engine that we have not yet proposed because the other engines really do not naturally explain this. Um, and I think that's pushed us into, a, I think, a nice area of understanding how supernova um, really work. Um, and uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a nice example of how we had a basic model um, guided by the data. We then made some predictions from this model and then the we used some data to uh, validate that, that new model. So this, the convective engine model now really, this is a true, um, Stern Colgate called this the second hand clapping because we would have a model, but if we had no prediction that then is confirmed by data, we only have one hand clapping. Um, this data actually was that second hand clapping. Um, on the week before Sterling died, we got this data and I took it to him and showed him um, that his model that he had pushed for so many years um, actually now has that second hand. Um, so that's kind of exciting. Um, the next lecture I'll give this afternoon will be on supernova spectra and light curves and what we can learn from that. And with that, I'll end for today, or for this morning. Uh, so, so unfortunately, new star is not, there's, you need a big remnant to actually image uh, with new star. Uh, they have observed 87A, uh, but they can't map it. They can only get the, uh, the line Doppler shift. Um, for 87A, the, um, you can look at the velocities. 87A, remember, for the gamma rays, looked like it was best fit by an explosion that was really strong in one direction. Um, and it turns out that uh, the new star titanium measurement agrees with that result. Um, we saw, so it, it, doesn't, it doesn't really change our picture because we already had that from the iron lines and the, the gamma ray lines. But it, it is true that we see in the titanium as well, this, it looks like it's dominated by a, a, a single lobe explosion going in one direction. Um, the, beyond that, we don't have, 
we don't have any other good examples of where we can map with the new star satellite. The plan that new star has is to try to get something that you know the next generation uh, kind of uh, satellite for new star would be um, getting something that can get better resolution um, and better energy resolution and be stronger to maybe try um, to get to further remnants. But unfortunately, this is a hard observation to do. You need a nearby remnant at roughly the right age to make the titanium measurement. So there's not a lot of other remnants we can do the study on, um, unfortunately. Um. <coughs> Thank you.